Hello and welcome. I'm Valerie Paley, Senior Vice President and Sue Ann Weinberg, Director of the Patricia D. Klingenstein Library at the New York Historical Society. I would like to begin by thanking Louise Mirror, our President and CEO, Agnes Su Tang, Chair of the Board of Trustees, and Pam Schaffler, our Chair Emerita, and all of our trustees, in particular the champions of our library, Patricia D. Klingenstein, Sue Ann Weinberg, and Sidney Lapidus. We also acknowledge the generosity of the Mellon Foundation, the Robert David Lyon Gardner Foundation, Helen and the late Robert Appel, and the National Endowment for the Humanities, along with our Chairman's Council, our members, and our many other donors. None of the work of New York Historical is possible without your continued and committed support. The Patricia D. Klingenstein Library at New York Historical is one of the oldest, most distinguished research libraries in the United States. It holds millions of books, newspapers, maps, manuscripts, prints, photographs, and architectural collections. It is a vital center of research into the history of New York and the nation. Key to that research is the presence of a yearly rotation of scholarly fellows, both in residence and in a short-term capacity. Our fellows are engaged in advancing knowledge as they mine New York historicals collections for new ways of interpreting the American past. We are most fortunate to have them in our midst. Tonight's program will give you just a taste of the quality of the work that is being done. Atlantic City, 1964, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and the struggle for racial justice will last approximately 45 minutes, including 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end, which you can submit via the Q&A function on your Zoom screen at any point during the presentation. The chat function has been disabled, so please do make sure to use the Q&A. We welcome your questions. After the presentation, we will get to as many as time allows. This evening, I will be joined in conversation by Julian Seltzer, 2022-23 Lapidus Weisberg Fellow at the New York Historical Society. Julian is a New York Times bestselling author, CNN political analyst, and regular guest on NPR's Here and Now. He has authored, co-authored, and edited over 1,200 op-eds and 25 books, including Myth America, Historians Take on the Biggest Lies and Legends About Our Past, The Fierce Urgency of Now, Lyndon Johnson, Congress, and the Battle for the Great Society, winner of the D.B. Hardman Prize for the Best Book on Congress, and Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of the Speaker, and the Rise of the New Republican Party, named by the New York Times as an editor's choice and one of the 100 notable books in 2020. He received his PhD in history from Johns Hopkins University and currently serves as the Malcolm Stevenson Forbes Class of 1941 Professor of History and Public Affairs at Princeton University. Welcome, Julian. Thank you. It's great to be with you. And it's great to have you with us. Um, so you're working on a book about the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, part of the Freedom Summer Mobilization. Tell us a bit, a bit about it, about the project. Sure. Um, it's been wonderful, I must say, to spend uh, a year at the New York Historical Society. I've been upstairs in the library working on this really important story that is often mentioned in books, uh, but it hasn't been really uh, focused on. The story happens in Freedom Summer, which is in 1964. It's a major mobilization of civil rights activists in Mississippi, where local activists have been working for years. Uh, people like Bob Moses and Fannie Lou Hamer on uh, voting rights for Black Americans, and they recruit through organizations like SNCC, college students from the North, uh, to come down for the summer. And there's many different projects that are part of Freedom Summer. Uh, freedom schools are created, which are schools uh, to provide instruction uh, outside the public school system uh, for Black Mississippians and it includes subject matter uh, like uh, the history of race relations in the United States, the kinds of topics the public schools wouldn't teach. Uh, there were also um, registration drives where activists went out uh, in the Delta and other parts of the state door to door, uh, trying to convince people to go to the courthouse to register, which was incredibly dangerous uh, and intimidating. There are um, social centers, which provide everything from movies in the afternoon for adults to libraries for kids to spend time after school. And one big part of this mobilization is what I'm writing about. It was called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And basically, Black Mississippians could not participate 
in party politics, in democratic primaries. They were excluded um, through all kinds of mechanisms. And so uh, the movement basically creates an alternative party in Mississippi, an integrated party. And they send a delegation of 68 representatives who are selected through the kind of exact same process the state Democrats pick their delegates to Atlantic City, New Jersey, which is where Democrats were meeting uh, to nominate Lyndon Johnson, who had become president after John F. Kennedy died, uh, to run against Barry Goldwater, uh, a conservative Republican from Arizona. And the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party tells the Democrats, we want to be seated, that the white delegates who are there have no right to be seated. They are only there because uh, they were disenfranchised. And so it's a huge battle. And in the end, President Johnson is more scared of a racial backlash from the South than he is committed to what they are asking for. And he offers a very watered down solution. It's not really a compromise. He gives them two symbolic seats instead of being able to be actual participants. And for many activists, including people like John Lewis, they walk away totally disillusioned uh, with this party, the Democrats who are now saying they were on the side of civil rights uh, and to a party that had just seated uh, white politicians who were committed to a system of apartheid back in their own state. Uh, so it's a real turning point for a lot of civil rights activists. The uh, Black Power movement, um, in part, it emerges out of this. Stokely Carmichael, who had been involved in Freedom Summer, writes a book about this, about Black Power that comes out soon after. And, and this whole controversy is a centerpiece of of what of what he's writing and for johnson it's a very interesting period because you know he is not against civil rights he actually wants to continue in a second term pushing for legislation but these fears of a potential backlash are so overwhelming it leads him it leads hubert humphrey who will be vice president it leads many liberals to come out against these activists who are plant who are sharecroppers and domestic workers and independent entrepreneurs and come on the side of some of the most reactionary forces in American politics. It's really quite an amazing story that I wanted to uh, try to share with readers. And that's what I'm in the process of doing. It's, it's, the narrative has such a broad sweep, but, um, and, and we'll talk more about that, but what are the key questions you're trying to tackle here? Oh, well, one is the idea of institutional racism. And uh, we hear that a lot today, and it's become certainly part of the uh, conversation about how race works in America, that it's not simply intentional acts of discrimination or dis intentional acts of racial violence uh, that are a problem, but it's the way in which racism is inscribed into our institutions, political, economic, social institutions, that racism perpetuates, perpetuates itself regardless of what the people working in the institutions do or don't do. And this was a great way, I thought, a powerful way to get at that, because that's what the delegates were talking about. Um, it wasn't simply actor A or B in Mississippi politics. It was how the Democratic Party had been built around Southern power in a way where someone like Lyndon Johnson, even once Johnson becomes committed to civil rights, just can't see a way out of placating um, racial inequality. So one of the most important was that. Second is more on Johnson's kind of complicated presidency. And um, this is a critical period in 1964. And I really wanted to get into how some of his fears of the right, uh, which were very pronounced, uh, he was much more scared of the right than he was of liberals and the left, um, how they often led him away from decisions that could really have uh, put the federal government much more squarely on the side of an even more robust civil rights uh, agenda. And it's also just a story of ordinary people trying to affect huge change. I mean, the people in my story, they're not even the Martin Luther Kings of the movement. Uh, these are kind of very ordinary Americans. And even the leaders, people like Bob Moses are kind of quiet grassroots organizers um, uh, 
who are really focused on local mobilization. And they wanted to tell their story and mm -hmm. uh, tell the story of how, even though they didn't achieve what they wanted, they were center stage for this moment, putting these issues squarely on the national agenda. Uh, you mentioned some of these figures, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, Bob Moses, John Lewis, Douglas Carmichael, and of course Johnson. Um, you know, who are who are they, and and how do they figure in a larger sense in in, in the narrative? Yeah, I mean, there's different. So there's different clusters of characters in the book. There are Mississippians uh, who um, were raised and worked in Mississippi, who suffered through all sorts of violence. Uh, because of race. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer is a very uh, poignant example of that, um, simply for the fact that she tried to register to vote and um, became involved in the movement. She was violently assaulted uh, in a prison, famously. She would talk about this at the Democratic Convention, physically assaulted and brutalized uh, in ways where she carried the scars for the rest of her life, or Aaron Henry, who's a pharmacist, a kind of black entrepreneur in Mississippi, who had gained some stature by the early '60s uh, as a as a business person. Uh, he's there uh, as well, um, but again, not extraordinary. Just a figure who locally really made his name known and was part of the NAACP. So that's one cluster, the, the locals uh, who decide to do something heroic and risk life and limb, literally, uh, as well as job and, and stability to do this. Second are activists who come from outside and are trying to make this real. And so one of the major characters throughout my book is this Bob Moses. His name is Bob Moses. Um, and uh, he... Uh, was a rather extraordinary person. He was from New York. Uh, he went to Hamilton College and studied philosophy. And then he taught at Horace Mann. Uh, he was teaching mathematics. He had dropped out of a Harvard doctoral degree, but he decides to pick up and go to Mississippi in 1961, uh, inspired by what he saw at the sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina, and to devote his whole life, uh, or certainly these years of his life, uh, to organizing and to a philosophy of movement building where it wasn't about leadership, it was about empowering individuals to lead the movement themselves and to make decisions about what was necessary. And then a third bucket of kind of characters in the book are the politicians and certainly the Democratic politicians, Lyndon Johnson, who at this point uh, is moving forward with a historic civil rights bill, who believes he is the president who's finally delivering on the promise of racial equality, He's starting to think of a Voting Rights Act. Um, and he and Hubert Humphrey, who's the senator from, from uh, Minnesota, who's going to become the vice president, they're all committed to this liberal cause. They're kind of trapped in some of the limitations of liberalism circa 74. And finally, there's Barry Goldwater, who kind of looms over the whole book. Um, this was the Republican nominee in 64, really quite radical at the time, far right uh, by the standards of the day, votes against the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and is causing ongoing consternation for people like Johnson or Humphrey and civil rights activists about what would happen if he became president and what would happen if he had Republicans like him in power. So those those are the characters and um, and the clashes and tensions between them are at the center of the narrative. Now, it's a very rich narrative indeed, but maybe anyone who's who's um, sort of logging onto this is is familiar with the story of Freedom Summer, but maybe just set us up. What was Freedom Summer exactly? Yeah, it's it's uh, so the civil rights movement um, has been taking place for decades before 64. And the more we study it, the longer it becomes. Uh, but it's accelerating in the early 1960s. And, and I'm sure many people watching know different elements of it, the Montgomery uh, bus boycott, um, the clashes that take place in Birmingham in 1963. Freedom Summer is this idea where the activists in Mississippi, both locals and people like Bob Moses, they're starting to conclude um, going into 64 that unless 
people come in from outside, unless they bring in recruits and volunteers from outside, um, they're not going to get protection from the federal government uh, as they're being accosted and attacked by police and KKK um, organizations. And if they bring in students, college students from the North, they would not only have much more human power to run the program for the summer, but it would just bring the kind of attention in the media um, from middle-class families throughout the country and what civil rights was about that local activists couldn't do on their own. And it was controversial as, as uh, groups like SNCC uh, and CORE, two of the big groups are debating whether to do Freedom Summer. There's some local activists who don't want students coming in from outside. They say they're gonna take over essentially what uh, locals are doing. All of a sudden it will be about white students as opposed to um, black activists and that it would create danger that you know when they're there, there was a high chance someone would get killed uh, or hurt, and then what happens? Um, but in the end, they decide to do it. And they decide that if they work on all of these projects, not only will the projects be important, the schools, the voter registration, the um, uh, community centers, and the Mississippi Freedom Party, uh, but by the end of the summer, everyone will know what's going on in Mississippi. Everyone will understand the stakes and the risks involved uh, in, in trying to challenge race relations in the deep South. And that is actually what happened. It's, it's quite successful. And, uh, for a lot of the students who go there, it's eye-opening. They had never imagined, um, what they were going to encounter. It's terrifying. They live day in and uh, day out worrying about whether, uh, kind of a, a van without a pickup truck without a license plate is gonna drive by with someone ready to take shots at them. Uh, but it also teaches them just how deeply entrenched racism is and the kind of fight this will take, not over a year, but over decades uh, to undo the legacies of, of slavery and Jim Crow. Um, so it's a really kind of uh, over a thousand students come into the state um, and it's a, uh, it's a big moment in civil rights history. It gets, it gets some publicity because of the, the danger and violence also for, uh, certainly one would think. It does. So, so Mississippi had already been receiving steadily more attention. Uh, for example, in 1962 or 63 before freedom summer, one of the things Mississippi officials do, uh, to punish these activists is they end, a a, a program um, where food commodities were given in the winter when the cotton picking season slowed down to local residents. And they just shut off this federal program basically uh, to starve people. Uh, and and uh, Dick Gregory, who's a comedian and civil rights actor, actually flies into the state and brings on this chartered airplane food uh, to distribute. And, and the media, because it's him, covers this. Harry Belafonte, who just passed away before Freedom Summer, made many trips there and also raised attention for the cause. But ultimately, there's nothing like what actually happens in Freedom Summer. And one of the stories that will captivate the nation, the story, is uh, two uh, civil rights workers from the New York area, um, uh, uh, Mickey uh, Schwerner and Goodman, and a local um, activist named James Cheney, uh, they're murdered. Uh, they are at the orientation that takes place right before Freedom Summer. They drive into Mississippi early because a church where they had the three of them or, or two of them had been working uh, and the third joins them was burned down. And so Schwerner wants to see what's going on. And they go back and they go missing. And for much of the summer through early August, no one knows where they are. They find a burnt out car um, and they can't find the bodies. And it becomes a story that's covered on a daily basis. Johnson is consumed with this. He's really worried about what's going to happen when the inevitable happens, meaning the discovery of the bodies. And it brings national attention. It scares all of the activists in ways that nothing had scared them because this was very real. And ultimately, in early August, before the Democratic Convention, the bodies are found and they're just, uh, you know, mangled and destroyed. Um, and and it becomes a symbol for why this fight has to happen 
and so that is the story I see me referring to um, yeah. that really um, is a, a kind of centerpiece of Freedom Summer and a centerpiece of American dialogue during that period. Absolutely. And when we hear a Freedom Summer, this is always the story that we hear, not some of these other stories as yeah. much as, as you will be telling in your book. So what were the conditions for Black Americans and civil rights activists in Mississippi? Uh, terrible. Um, <laughs> it's hard to really kind of overstate uh, the level of danger that that you faced. So uh, the process of a, just of an ordinary Black Mississippian who wanted to register, you had to go to the courthouse and you got to the courthouse and the way it worked, there was a registrar there and the registrar was not welcoming or friendly. They had very little interest in registering you. And because of the way the state laws work uh, from the Jim Crow era, they would give a test uh, to every potential registrant where they would ask one provision from the state constitution, very specific, and you'd have to write it down, and then you'd have to offer an interpretation of what it meant. Uh, and the registrar had sole discretion whether to pass you or not, and 95% of the time they would not pass uh, a, a Black Mississippian trying to register. And that's why rates of voting until 1965 were under 6% of, of the population. Not only that, uh, once you tried to register, your name would be put in the local newspaper uh, and it was identifiable whether you were black or white uh, because of whether mm -hmm. they included Mr. and Mrs. in front of your name. And why that was important was your employer would know that you tried to register and often someone would get fired for doing that. Local vigilante groups wouldn't have your name and often um, you could be subject to a physical attack. Uh, for activists uh, who tried to help this registration process, I can't tell you how many stories I found in the archives because uh, SNCC and other civil rights groups documented every act of violence. And that could range from uh, what happened to the three civil rights workers where um, they're accosted and killed uh, to having to go to jail where the police would uh, either beat you themselves or they would put you in a cell um, where someone else would do that for them. Uh, even just heard a, a horrendous story uh, on an oral history where one of the practices of the time was occasionally a guard would tell uh, someone who had been imprisoned, an activist or a local, you can go now, someone has paid for your bond. And uh, anyone from Mississippi knew to ask who exactly paid for it, because if you didn't, they basically would let you out and they would be able to shoot you and say you tried to escape. Uh, those were the kinds of conditions. And then, lo you know, local white residents would constantly harass the activists in Freedom Summer. They would firebomb different buildings. Um, they would burn crosses, the KKK and comparable organizations that formed uh, on, on lawns when they're searching for the three Mississippi freedom workers. Um, they're kind of going into the river and dredging up bodies and they find other bodies and they aren't even the bodies of the Mississippi right. workers. There are other civil rights activists who had been killed and, and, and buried. And so this is the kind of life that you lived and the kind of risks that you incurred. And one last thing on this, in the, they have an orientation, the Freedom Summer students, uh, before they go into Mississippi. And the orientation is in Ohio at a college campus. And they're given a security manual where you kind of read through not only what life is like, but what you have to do. You never sleep near the front window of a home because that's where shots could be fired. Uh, if you see a pickup truck without a license plate, it was important to quickly get to safe cover because that was often uh, someone from the KKK or not even from the KKK coming to uh, in, in, uh, inflict an act of violence. So. Those were the risks, conditions. Bob Moses, within a month of getting to Mississippi in 1961, is brutally attacked just because he's escorting three people to the courthouse. Someone kind of hits him with the um, bottom side of a knife on the head and he's just, he'll require many stitches. Um, so that was just the reality of, of uh, activism and, and life in the South. You're truly brave to be doing this. Um... 
And Lyndon Johnson certainly had his work cut out for him. Tell, what are you learning about him? I and mean, we hear all about what um, Bob Carroll was learning about <laughs> Lyndon Johnson, but how how are you seeing a picture of, of the president of all? Yeah, he's, I mean, I've spent a lot of time studying him over the years. He's He's been in many different books of mine. So I'm, I'm fascinated with him. And I think this is a story, I mean, uh, A, it's, he is complex. Uh, it's it's not that he again was against what the activists were even fighting for. I mean, he I, I do believe he had come around by sixty four and sixty five to embracing the cause of civil rights um, and ultimately understanding. And he says this in phone conversations: what they were asking was reasonable, and what they were saying about the Mississippi white delegates who he did not like. They were actually supporting Barry Goldwater, even though they were Democrats. What they were saying was true. But he's also just trapped by this ongoing fear of a backlash. Uh, it, it so dominates his thinking uh, from the right that sometimes he can't see his way uh, to a different uh, road forward that would kind of more fully embrace a robust uh, civil rights agenda. And he was often someone who's who had to be forced by activists to do stuff. It's it's not as if he came around to this all on his own and was fully on board. What becomes clear is he gets there because he's being pushed by this immense grassroots mobilization. And finally, it shows again, this is something I've often argued, there were limits to what President Johnson could do. Um, he was a very savvy and skilled and one of the best politicians we've had in the White House. But he was also not a superhuman. Uh, and in this case, you see him totally not trapped. That's the wrong word because he always has room to act differently. But uh, he is working within a context where he can't see a way out. And uh, there is no maneuver that's obvious to him. And uh, ultimately, because of the structure of democratic politics at the time, because of the way the convention worked, he backs away and he does something which is uh, really intolerable to even people like Martin Luther King, who's not part of the movement, this part of the movement as much, but he sees this is really the wrong thing. And Johnson even gets Hubert Humphrey to do his dirty work for him. I mean, that's how far he will go. This Hubert Humphrey is the epitome of a civil rights supporter at the time. And he, Johnson says, basically, if you want to be vice president, you go in and you kill the deal. And that's what Hubert Humphrey does. So, so Johnson is someone ultimately... Uh, who is both propelled by this movement, uh, but also very constrained and unable to move beyond those constraints by the structure of Southern politics and racial politics circa 64. Maybe we'll get back to Johnson in the Q&A. By the way, we have, I have a couple more questions before we open it up to Q&A. Anyone who has a burning question of our, of our speaker, please uh, put it in the Q&A function. Um, so uh, as a, a library fellow at New York Historical, I'm, I'm curious about uh, archival materials and your sources. What, what, what are you finding either at New York Historical or elsewhere? And uh, what are some more unusual sources, archival materials you're finding? Yeah, it's, it's fortunate. It's, it's uh, an abundance of sources, which is always good, uh, also challenging. But um, so some of the sources I like, I tend to like archives the most. That's just my, professionally, I'm always most comfortable with that more than interviews. It just uh, kind of resonates and uh, is, is a way I process what was happening at the time. So one example that's an amazing resource, and anyone could look at this, it's a Freedom Summer uh, digital collection where the Wisconsin Historical Society, which collects a lot of 1960s activists uh, and organizations and, and kind of progressive movement collections, they have a huge collection on Freedom Summer and they've digitized it. So I actually, before I even went there a few months ago to the Wisconsin, I've been doing a lot of great research right online on my computer. Uh, and this includes memos, it includes incident reports that uh, the Freedom Summer activists were jotting down. Um, uh, about violence against them. It includes communications. Uh, it even includes material, really horrendous material from some of the white reactionary groups. It's it's thousands and thousands of pages. Mm 
I've gone to different archives. I've been at the Johnson archives this year. I went to Wisconsin in Washington. Some of the players within the Democratic Party, like a lawyer named Harold Leventhal, who was the lawyer for the DNC, his papers are there and were very helpful. So uh, a kind of, and of course the tapes, the, which everyone loves the uh, tapes. And there's a lot of recordings of Lyndon Johnson talking about this in those weeks at Atlantic City. So those have all been great and no shortage. Uh, I mean, really, I'm going to have to stop at some point or it could be endless. Uh, there are uh, there some of the members uh, from the time are around, some of the activists, and I will interview them, uh, uh, but I'm waiting. And one of the reasons is many of them conducted numerous interviews starting in the 60s right through today that I've been listening to, um, including people like Moses and Fannie Lou Hamer. And you can hear their stories, uh, even on audio, again, online. It's, a, it's incredible. Wow. Um, so I'm using that. And finally, I did, I went, um, I went a few months ago now, uh, I went I, to Atlantic City. Um, this is a little different than what I usually do, just to see the different places um, where a lot of this went down. Uh, from a church, uh, the Union Baptist Church, where the Mississippi Freedom Party would meet every morning and where uh, ultimately they met and voted to reject what Johnson was offering them. It's a little, little church. It's in the exact same condition it was then. They don't have a lot of money. It's not a museum. And one of the congregants who was a child back in 64, she sat with me for like three hours um, basically kind of telling me stories she knew and showing me different little parts of the church. Her mother uh, was there in 64. She cooked for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. She was one of the uh, kind of leaders of the church. And I went to the place where the convention center was and someone gave me a tour of different sites, um, uh, including the exact place where Fannie Lou Hamer testifies and television cameras cover it. Um, so I did a little of that kind of research. I'll probably do a I'm going to go to Mississippi on a, a longer trip and see some of the sites. So those are the different ways. And again, I'll, and I'll interview some of the remaining uh, people, but there's so much out there. Um, mm -hmm. I feel very fortunate with this story. You find that the, the altered built environment of Atlantic City is, is just... Do you still see vestiges of what was there in 1964? I mean, obviously you do, but how does it feel just walking those streets? It's a very altered, different place now. It is altered. And obviously the casinos uh, just dominate yeah. the um, the shore and the kind of beachside area. But some of it's very similar. So the place that was the convention center no longer is is now like a hall, which they use for concerts and I think sports. Um, but physically, some of it's been rehabbed. Some of it was exactly the same. I mean, uh, the room where the delegates testified to the credentials committee, it's pretty much what it looked like. And we were looking at pictures. It, it hasn't changed that much. There's a balcony uh, for the center that overlooks the ocean where at the very end of the convention, Johnson walks out, it's his birthday. And he kind of looks out and he sees supporters, he sees protesters beneath him. And that's physically pretty much the same. But I think the most important for me in going, and this is something that's similar, it's small. I mean, this is not a Chicago or New York City. Uh, the boardwalk is very narrow. Um, and that's where all this was, all the protesting and the media was all there. Um, mm -hmm. And that's pretty much intact, that kind of uh, part of the city. Um, so you can see remnants of it and you can see why this would be so fraught. Um, again, people are not dispersed. They're all congregated in this little area. Even the, the white Mississippi delegates are gonna be walking right by the protesters as they were getting into the convention. There wasn't a lot of room to separate. Uh, and I think that's important to understand the atmosphere at the time. I even went uh, on the day that Johnson comes to accept the nomination, he and uh, Humphrey stayed much of the day in the home of like a big Democratic donor, which is about five, 10 minutes drive from the convention center. So I went to see the home. I had the address and it's still pretty much intact. No one on the block knew what I was looking. I was taking pictures. Really? 
And yeah. everyone's like, what are you taking a picture of this house for? And I told, they had no idea this had been the house where President of the United States had been um, wow. the day he was getting nominated. So there was enough there. There's enough still there that's comparable. It actually gives a great feel um, for what this was like. Oh, that's great. Um, how wonderful. Uh, I'll, I'll go to the questions now. Uh, there are some coming in. Some of you already answered, but uh, here's one. Uh, I read that LBJ used the A4 test, the Supreme Court nomination to take attention off Hamer's testimony at the 1964 convention. Is that a true story? So no, so the story, uh, close. The story is, uh, so, so basically the delegates get there, uh, the MFDP delegates and the credentials committee is this committee which usually no one pays attention to. It, they're just accepting the credentials, voting. Everyone has credentials, you can come in. In 64, it becomes a big issue because these activists appear and testify and they're saying, we want uh, the credentials. So the media wants to cover this story. There's not a lot to cover in this convention because it's kind of clear what's gonna happen. So they cover this. And Fannie Lou, several of them testify, including Martin Luther King, but the testimony that becomes riveting is Fannie Lou Hamer, who worked on a plantation, who became an activist because she went to a mass church meeting uh, where she heard about what they were doing. She's beaten and assaulted in a prison and she testifies and she tells her story. Within minutes, it's riveting. Uh, mm -hmm. All the accounts say the people on the credentials committee have tears in their eyes people watching are, are moved. And all of a sudden, midway through her testimony, the networks announced they're cutting away because Johnson is having an impromptu press conference. And he has a press conference and it, basically it's not Fortis. He announces that it's the nine month anniversary of John Connolly from Texas having been shot during the Kennedy uh, parade. It wasn't clear like, why was he saying this? And so the story goes, and certainly the activists believe this, that Johnson purposely did that to cut away uh, from testimony, which was beyond damaging to Johnson, beyond damaging to the Democrats. I'm not 100% sure that's actually what happened. There was a press conference already scheduled. Uh, Johnson had had a meeting with the governors of different states that ends and it was scheduled to end right when she was doing her testimony before it was clear when she was gonna testify. So I have contradictory um, information. I'm gonna try to find out. It's just not clear whether it was intentional. Regardless, that's where activists were in thinking of Johnson by that time. They didn't trust him. And uh, they, Fannie Lou Hamer is livid when she finds out that they cut away. The end of the story though, is at night, the networks play the testimony in its entirety on the news. And it makes Johnson look even worse because what this question says is what people then were assuming, that he was scared and he was trying every trick in the book to basically shut them down. Interesting and uh, fascinating. I'm, I have a question just to, uh, you know, like, again, uh, New York historical related in that uh, we do have uh, the Robert Caro papers in our process of, of uh, processing them so the public can make use of, of his work. And certainly we all know that he's working on his last volume uh, in his Johnson uh, biography series. How does your uh, point of view about Johnson differ or resemble Caro's? I mean, do you have, do you take the same sort of, you know, do you, do you agree with, with Caro's point of view about, about his, his subject or do you take a, a different kind of approach. No, I, th I mean, I think we're generally in agreement about a lot of the issues of the period. I think I tend to look at the context in which Johnson was working. I think uh, Caro tends to look more at Johnson and uh, kind of his internal drive and strategy. They're complementary. I think they're both essential parts of the story. But that's what fascinates me. So mm -hmm. I wrote a book in 2015, The Fierce Urgency of Now, which was really about how changes in Congress gave someone like Johnson the ability to do what he did. And that also is about the pressure that civil rights movement activists were placing on Congress was so immense and on Johnson that it's also important to put that in the story, that context to get why it happened. And I think I'm doing the same thing 
today more of a limitation. I'm, I'm fascinated with, you know, how does someone like Johnson, who's so savvy and, and so skillful, sometimes he's either finds himself checked and, and he can't do what uh, he wants to do or makes decision where he backs away from bold action. Like, why does that happen? And so I think uh, Caro's more focused on the internal uh, and I'm more focused on the context. I always think the books read well together. The work reads yeah. well together to give you a full picture uh, of, of how it, not just Johnson worked, but the question that we are both interested in. How does the presidency and congressional power work in this country ultimately and mm -hmm. the relationship between them? Yeah, I, 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 I saw that sort of uh, uh, parallelism, and, and I was just curious if I was just misinterpreting it out of wishful thinking. <laughs> um, one of our uh, questions uh, just concerns Mississippi politics and how they differ today from back then. Uh, do you have a comment about that? Sure. I mean, look, there's been several stories about Mississippi recently that uh, quickly bring back uh, bad memories of uh, some of the legacy of the state, and there's been battles over um, kind of the state legislature asserting control over different issues from water to policing in, in cities uh, with uh, large black populations. And I, I think it's clear that, um, that what was going on in the 60s uh, continues in different versions today, that racism, and racial inequality and tension isn't gone from the body politic. And Mississippi has always been one of the states um, where some of this is harshest. Mississippi's obviously changed. You've had the growth of um, suburbs, for example, and more cosmopolitan areas. You've had new industry has come into the state. I think uh, demographically, um, like we've seen in many states, you've had a lot of important shifts. Um, so. Uh, to say that racism isn't still there, and it is, and to say it doesn't play out in ugly ways, isn't to say everything is the same. And in addition to the state having changed, I mean, the kind of violence that was normalized, I tell students this, in 64 and 65, really has to be absorbed. I mean, we're not just talking um, about acts of violence sporadically happening. We're talking about, in 64, organized, state-sanctioned violence against uh, Black Mississippians or white activists working for the movement, um, where you had members of the state legislature were in a group like the White Citizens Council, which was a cleaned up version of the Klan. Some were in the Klan. Police and sheriffs were all in the Klan or had families in it. Um, you know, the, the three Mississippi workers, the way they ultimately are killed is they're arrested during a drive, they're put in jail, they're let out by the deputy sheriff who is involved with the Klan and, and gives word that they're leaving so that they can be killed in the dead of night. So it's a state where I think that difference is significant. Doesn't mean things are right today. And it doesn't mean uh, there's not many, many deep racial problems. Uh, but I also think it's important to understand the severity of the violence um, and obviously the disenfranchisement. This was not a little disenfranchisement. This was systematic racial disenfranchisement that was accepted at the highest levels of power in the state. The governor was firmly, all the governors were firmly against what the activists were doing. It was simply a question of how forceful would you be uh, in putting it down rather than were you against it? Yeah. Yeah, and you, you speak of, of, you spoke a little earlier about this turning point aspect, uh, that this is, uh, uh, as you say, an origin story of how institutional racism became a central issue and in the national discourse. And um, this is one, one aspect of it. Do you want to comment on that a little more? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it, it definitely kind of float, doesn't flow to the service. It's elevated uh, to the forefront. Um, as a result of this, uh, it's not really the kind of racial issue that is being discussed as much nationally, but here just reading the press accounts, I mean, they are talking about how parties are organized in such a way to perpetuate racism. That is a discussion about institutions and institutional structure. They didn't always use that term. They didn't use the term, but that's what they were looking at. And 
Those kinds of questions only become more important as the 60s go on. Uh, King and the poor people's movement will be talking about how the structure of the economy uh, perpetuates racism. The Kerner Commission, which is a group uh, that Johnson puts together in 68 after the unrest in the cities, will talk about policing and the way in which, again, it's not simply individual police that's the problem, it's policing that is the problem. And they'll talk about that. So this is right at the beginning of this conversation. And I, I really feel that it's important, not just for the activists, which it was. Uh, I mean, Lewis would talk about this, even once he's in Congress, long in his career, he always remembered this. He always mm -hmm. said, we played by the rules and they still um, weren't willing um, to respond to our needs. Um, but beyond the activists, I think it, it's very important. And, and part of it is because of what we've been talking about. People like Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, they personalize this. Uh, you, you saw the story unfold in a very compelling way. A lot of reporters couldn't help uh, but get deeper and deeper into a story that before many of them were not covering. And mm -hmm. what life was like in Mississippi, uh, again, not just racial violence by individual against individual, but institutionalized racial violence where the state, the arms of the state government supported and endorsed this and carried it out. Um, mm -hmm. There was a group that Mississippi had a commission that was basically like a mini FBI uh, whose job it was, was to spy on uh, activists, to spread disinformation and smears about activists, to tell groups what activists were doing. This was all baked into the system. And the whole point of Freedom Summer was unless you undo the system, unless you truly dismantle the way the whole institution works, all these institution works, racism is not going to go away. So it was a powerful argument that we hear right through today. And this comment elicits another question uh, about Mississippi. Is it known what the current Black voter registration and participation is? It is. I don't have that number uh, yeah. at the top. I mean, it jumps from under 6% to over 60% after the Voting Rights Act of 1965 within really, uh, I think, four or five years. So it's a huge jump that takes place. And I'm, I'm sure the numbers are still relatively high, obviously. Right. Oh, that, that, is, that is a huge job. Um, so what are the next steps in your project? So um, so I've written, I, I mean, I've started to draft the book and I have a lot of the research done. So I guess the next pillars will be, unfortunately, my sabbatical here will end, which is uh, it's always sad, but I feel good about how the year went. I'll continue to do research. I'm not done with that. And I'm especially interested in now trying to interview a few people and going to Mississippi and spending a little time there. I'll keep writing. I like to write research and revise like all at once. I'm not uh, sequential that way. Um, so I'm going to um, keep working on multiple fronts. I mean, next year I'll be teaching, but I'll, I'll continue to do that. Uh, I imagine a couple of years this will take as a whole. I took a little short break in the last month and a half, I'm writing another short book, different kind of book on uh, partisanship in American politics. Um, and, and so I, I actually, I did it on, I mean, not only was I interested in this book, but my writing process, taking a little break is often good, kind of regroup. And then I come back to it in a few months and I kind of see it with fresh eyes. So I imagine the next two years between teaching and and redrafting will be what I do. and And then, hopefully into production. Great, that's wonderful. And we were so fortunate to have this process happening right in our uh, reading room library. Um, and so fortunate to have you there among our fellows. So thank you so much for being with us, um, Julian. Uh, we have unfortunately run out of time. So uh, thank you again. And we will I'll still see you. You're not, your fellowship isn't quite up yet. So. That's true. <laughs> thanks for having me. And thanks to everyone at the Historical Society. Sure, thank you. And, and for our audience, please sign up for our mailing list and follow us at nyhistory.org to get the latest on upcoming fellows talks like this one. And finally, the New York Historical Society is currently open Tuesday through Sunday. You can reserve your timed entry museum tickets on our website. And we hope to see you there on Central Park West to view the exhibitions Undercover, J.C. Leyendecker and American Masculinity, Kara Walker, Harper's Pictorial History of the Civil War Annotated, and nature crisis consequence, in addition to our numerous other off offerings. So thank you again.
and have a good night.